Let's bless his name together. Baruch Hu Ad Adonai HaMevorach Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Ba'ed Blessed be the Lord who is blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. From Devarim Deuteronomy 6.4, the cornerstone of our faith. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuto Le'olam Vo'ed Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Praise be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever. Amen. And when Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what is the most important command? He answered with the words of the Shema and said the following. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Messiah then said, The second command is like unto the first, V'yahavta l'recha kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We are going to sing some songs that also are tied in with today's message again. And when we think about the flood, and we think about all of the things that took place there, one thing is clear. God is always saying, rise, rise up. God is always wanting to restore, always wanting to bring us back, and always wanting to open up the avenue for return. So we're going to begin with that song, Rise, Rise Up. Rise, rise up from the place that you've fallen. Rise, rise up to you I've been calling. Rise, rise up, I'm here now restoring. Rise, rise up, return to me. Rise, rise up from the place that you've fallen. Rise, rise up to you I've been calling. Rise, rise up, I'm here now restoring. Rise, rise up, and return to me. You wandered so far away, you missed the mark and went astray. But my heart reaches out to you still. Oh, you drifted so far away, and on your own you went astray. But saving your life is my biggest thrill. And restoring your life is at the heart of my will. Cause redeeming your life is not some new fancy frill. But restoring your life is at the heart and core of my will. It's the very core of my will. And I am here with you still. So rise, rise up. From the place that you fall in, rise, rise up. To you, I'm still calling. Rise, rise up. I'm here now restoring. Rise, rise up. 
return to me. Rise, rise up from the place that you fall in. Rise, rise up to you I'm still calling. Rise, rise up, I'm here now restoring. Rise, rise up, return to me. Whoa, rise, rise up from the place that you fall in. Rise, rise up to you I'm still calling. Rise, rise up, I'm here now restoring. Rise, rise up and return to me. Yes, rise, rise up and return to me. Oh, yes, rise, rise up and return now to me. Baruch Hashem. He is so good. He wants us to return. He wants us to experience all the benefits of his kingdom. And one of the things that happens is a lot of times when we look around and we see all the devastation that's going on in the world, all of the horrific things that people are capable of doing to one another, we can sometimes wonder if it's just too dark, if everything is falling apart. But the Bible says where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And we are called into action. We are called to be in a battle, a spiritual warfare. And so we go into the night not knowing what to expect, but knowing that God is there to bring us through and to restore all those who walk in darkness and have no light, that God is going to call us to go into the unknown with the one who knows everything and bring us through victoriously and rescue people who are in deep trouble and need to be experiencing God's salvation, his wholeness. Noonday in the night. Into the night, facing darkness and things we don't yet know. Still into the night, with all of our might, we now go. Oh, into the night, with darkness and fear all around. And into the night, uncertain of what will be found. Oh, yes, and into the night, your unfiltered light will abound. And with the light of your power and grace And in the light that shines from your face Oh, into the night Filled with your light we go Yes, into the night Filled with your light we now go And the darkness has to flee As your light sets people free And everyone will shine so bright Like noonday in the night Just like noonday in the night We go to set the captives free Open the eyes that cannot see To bring about what soon must be Like noonday in the night We shine like noonday in the night. Doesn't matter what catastrophe, what situation rises up, God is there to be on our side, to lead us through and take us to victory and to bring those that are captive free. It goes to set the captive free, open the eyes that cannot see, to bring about what soon must be. Like noonday in the night Yes, like noonday in the night Oh, come illuminate the night And shine like noonday in the night Restore by your great light Like noonday in the night Oh, come and bring your light So we can shine so bright Like noonday in the night, just like noonday in the night. 
Oh, yes, and into the night, restored by your light, we now go. The reason why we can go into the unknown and not be afraid is because God is with us to carry us through. And when people talk about the differences uh, of, uh, as some people say, what team you're on, we're not talking about teams. We're talking about the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're talking about that in the world there is none like our God. There is none like him in any way. And as we unite ourselves with him and allow him to transform us, we then can take the light that he brings us and reach out to people in darkness and see God deliver them. Because when it comes down to it, there is no comparison. There's no nobody who comes close. There's none like our God. Ain Kelohenu. Savior in everything, none is like 
none like him anywhere. God is so amazing, and he wants to impart to us things that are beyond our comprehension as we learn to yield ourselves to him. We welcome everyone to Beth Zion. Shabbat Shalom. Sabbath peace to you. Our calling as a congregation is to declare Messiah to the Jewish heart of central Jersey. Uh, if you look at the map of New Jersey, it's sort of like a body. And if it's shaped like a body, we're like right at the belly button. We are at the center. And um, <laughs> I don't know what that will give you as, a, as an uplifting moment. But the fact is that we are centered in a place where we can reach people. And we want to see God do something that has been in our hearts and prayers for decades, to be able to see the power of Messiah manifested throughout this region and hearts of people who are hungering with hopelessness, hungering for hope and hungering for an answer that we have the answer. It's Messiah Yeshua. And we want to be able to share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes to bring understanding. You know, this is not just five easy steps or, or, or say this prayer and everything's okay. There is a commitment that is brought upon us, but Messiah paid a price for us so that we could be free from all those things that bind us. The truth, he said, will set you free. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we need to be able to bring with clarity all of the, all of the misinformation about Yeshua over the years and of the Jewish people, the misinformation that has gone out needs to be clarified. It needs to be set straight. And we want to share the truth that can set people free, the truth of who Yeshua really was. And it's understood by understanding it through Jewish eyes, seeing what the context was and being able to see God do great and mighty things that we know not of to bring deliverance to all people, Jew and non-Jew alike, this message of hope for all people to experience relationship with God through the Messiah and experience oneness with him as we walk in union with him. We have our basket in the back for Hamaser Vahatruma for the tenth and the offering. You can place your offerings in that basket. There's envelopes if you need it. If you want to keep record of that, fill that out and use that. If you prefer to do it digitally, you can go to bethzion.org and use PayPal. Or you can mail it to Beth Zion, P.O. Box 807, Jackson, New Jersey, 08527. And we appreciate all of your prayers, all of your support, and all that God is doing in knitting us together as a people to be able to have impact in the communities around us. Sometimes you'll look around and say, well, we're kind of small. But you know what? God is not small. And he says, despise not the day of small things, because God has something in store. And all of the years and all of the prayers that have been built up and all of those things are not going to be with futility. They're going to be filled with answered prayer and with a move of God's spirit. I believe that we are on the verge of something very spectacular as we reach out and are not silent, but reach out to people in need and share with them the good news that can set them free and not be sidetracked by all of the mishigas and the words and the talking points that are out there, but to be set free by the power of God's spirit and all that Messiah wants to do. So we're grateful for that. A couple of quick announcements. Next Saturday... We will be not here. We are going to be meeting at the Beth Zion House next week. So mark that indelibly in your brain. Seal it on your heart. No. And write it down if you need to. But next week we will be at the Beth Zion House for our Shabbat service. And invite people to come out. It's always good to do that. You know, sometimes that's you say, oh, I don't know what to say to people about the Lord. Well, you can just share from your heart. But if you don't know what to say at all, just invite them out. Let them find out for themselves. Let them see what God is doing. Let God take that seed that we plant and see him bring it forth with fruit and with abundance. Of Enumah Cain, our Father and our King, we thank you for this time in your word. We ask you to open up our hearts so that your spirit can reveal to us deep things 
applications for us to be able to experience something special from you. Lord, we're not here to hear from man. We're here to hear from you. And we ask you to speak deeply to our hearts as we open up our hearts to you. In Yeshua's name, amen. Today's portion is the second section of the Torah. It is Noah, or Noah in the Hebrew. And it speaks of the flood and all of these things. And I have an unusual title today. It said, God's first cleanup operation against Hamas. Now, you may look at that and say, what in the world are you talking about? I did mention last week that the word for violence in Hebrew is Hamas. And so it says in the portion this week, it says in chapter 6, verse 9, here is the history of Noah. In his generation, Noah was a man righteous and wholehearted. Noah walked with God. Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with Hamas, with violence. God saw the earth, and yes, it was corrupt, for all living beings had corrupted their ways on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all living beings has come before me, for because of them the earth is filled with Hamas, with violence. I will destroy them along with the earth. And we have all of the description of the ark that was put together that Noah put up. We also saw, you know, when you look at this cleanup operation that God was doing, it was pretty dramatic. It actually tells us that it can get to a point where the violence is so increased to where people are unable to recognize reason at all. It's interesting, too, that if you look at this in connection with, I think it's kind of interesting that all of this is happening while this portion and last week's portion was coming forward. And if you look at it, there are a number of parallels that we can see in our own experience in, 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 in the things that are happening here. And I want to tie this in in that way. That's why I say God's first cleanup operation against Hamas, against violence. And if you look in the last verses, the first verses of chapter 6, which were the end of last week's portion, he said in verse 3, Hashem said, My spirit will not live in human beings forever, for they too are flesh. Therefore, their lifespan is to be 120 years. And then in verse 5, he says, Hashem said, saw that the people on earth were very wicked, that all of the imaginings of their hearts were always evil only. Hashem regretted that he had made humankind on the earth. It grieved his heart. Hashem said, I will wipe out humankind whom I have created from the whole earth and not only human beings, but animals, creeping things, birds in the air, for I regret that I ever made them. And then verse 8, but Noah found grace in the sight of Hashem. And by Noah finding grace in the eyes of Hashem, it was a new opportunity for humankind to once again have release from all of this corruption. Now, it says in another place that Noah preached to the people there for 120 years. So when people talk about cleanup operations, when they call in and talk about total devastating destruction, you've got to ask, they say, well, why don't we negotiate? Why don't we have a certain amount of diplomacy? In a way, Noah was having his diplomacy for 120 years. But when the violence is so devastating and the hearts of people so wicked and so evil, God is always looking for avenues of return. To get to the point that we see here, it must have been so devastating and so overwhelming where he says that their hearts were set to do evil all the time, always set to do evil. And it grieved God's heart. And so we see this 
this beginning of a total destruction and a restart. And when you look at it, people will say, well, couldn't he give them a chance? He did, 120 years. But here are some of the things that come into play. If you look in chapter 11, it says this. The whole earth used the same language. Well, this I, I want to bring this up afterwards. But there is something about that, the, this phrase. The whole earth used the same language and the same words. You know, it's funny. When you listen to the news, everybody's got their talking points. And whatever station you go to, they're all saying the very same thing, as if they're coming up with it on their own. But somewhere they're getting the same message, and they're presenting the same message. And what happens is there is no processing or reasoning that is happening. And in a way, all that Noah was doing in sharing with him as he was working to finish this boat, they looked at it and they said, what is this? There was something totally outside of the realm of reason on their, in their minds because there had not been rain. There was, well, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, climate change here too because they had the first major climate change. And I'm going to show you some elements there that are very interesting from a scientific standpoint because when you look at it, it brings out something very powerful. But you see, if you don't see something happening and something new is going to take place, you may wonder if anything would ever change. You have no reason to look outside of the box, to look outside of what is familiar. All of the talking points, all of the bubble, as they call it, all of this. And here the people were all unified in that they wanted to bring about a, a transformation, but they wanted it to be on their terms. They wanted to do what they wanted to do, and they were unable. They were so caught up in their own way of thinking that they were unable to reason. Their talking points were reinforced by everybody there. They mocked Noah. They saw what he was doing, thought it was the stupidest thing. He was building a boat, a giant boat. How crazy is that? They weren't near water. But it was pretty amazing to see what God was doing. There was a flood of judgment that came and the ark of deliverance that brought victory and salvation for the human race. God's strategy was to remove Hamas, to remove violence. And it was a very devastating process. Now, what you see, and I think this is something that we have to consider, God's amazing patience that he demonstrates with the human race. And that is that how often people get caught up in their narcissistic bandwagon groupthink approach to things. This is not something new. This is something that goes back to third millennia BC, BCE. You go back and you see this all happening. You see all of this taking place. And we see the human heart keeps doing the same things. When it's reinforced by people who think in the same way, who speak the same language, who speak and talk the same talking points. And then you see all of this coming about. You see the devastation that took place. And you see that until the flood came, they were unaware of any danger. They were unaware of anything going on. They were caught up. It says, as in the days of Noah, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. They were doing everything, marrying, giving in marriage. They were doing all these different things. In other words, saying, you know, I know sometimes people say, giving in marriage, ooh. What were they, you know, it wasn't talking about gay marriage or any of those things. It was talking about the fact that their lives were going on and they were so caught up in what they were doing, they were unable to see the pending doom that was coming upon them. They were unable to see the results of their actions in defiance towards God. 
and defiance towards one another as they ripped into one another, as they were continuously violent and filled with wickedness. And then when you come to chapter 11, after the flood, and I, I want to mention a couple of things about this. I mentioned I'm going to talk to you for a moment about climate change. But I want you to see something here, because climate change is a natural thing that happens. But there was such an upheaval of what God did at that time. It said that it hadn't rained. So what was he talking about? They had no reference point to believe that some kind of a cataclysmic event could take place like that. And if you remember, as it goes through it, it not only poured down rain, but water came up from the earth. It broke open everywhere. It was devastating. And they were unable to find a way. And here's the part also that's interesting. God shut Noah and his family in and locked the door. He shut the door because there would be a natural, when you hear the cries of people and the agony and all of the death and drowning that was going on, there might have been something that said, we should do something. Maybe we can make some room for summer. But it wasn't that way because the elements that were there, the, the, the violence and all of that needed to be stopped. God saw that it had to be an operation to clean it up and move forward. Now, what's also sad but interesting to look at is that after the flood, after the flood, <laughs> they were increasing in numbers. They were growing families, and all of this was happening. And then you see something of the Tower of Babel. And we have on here the uh, representation of the ark of the boat. And we have next to it a representation of the Tower of Babel. And what's interesting about this is you say, why would they build a tower? Well, we read that they wanted to build a tower to go to heaven, right? They wanted to, and God stopped them and confused their language. It's interesting that they had a network of language. Everybody spoke the same language, and they were determined that they were going to build this. And I've wondered why this tower, where they, they couldn't go, they couldn't get into space, they couldn't go to heaven and get it that high. What was it they were doing? Well, there were the beginnings in the third millennium BCE in the Mesopotamian Valley, there were what, what were called ziggurats. And they were these platforms that they built layer upon layer, rising up, and they made them to be as places of worship. Worship for whatever it was they were worshiping at that time. And in some ways, we have insights that some of the things that they were worshiping was the work of their own hands. They were also looking to, uh, it says in one place, actually a couple places, it said that they were, they were caught up with themselves. They were, it says before the flood, there were men of renown. After the flood, there was somebody named Nimrod, who was the first leader, the first king. And he also was a great hunter. And there was the understanding as they were looking to build a city and build a place, part of it may have been that after experiencing the flood, I don't know, but why all of a sudden these towers began to come up, these ziggurat would come up and be built. Maybe they were trying to find the idea of building higher ground Maybe if they thought that another flood would come, they would have a place that they built to go up to and be safe from floodwaters. I don't know. But they built this, and what you see is that it says in chapter 11, oh, before we get to that, I wanted to mention also, I mentioned about climate change. You know, with all of the upheaval that happened, it says that the, the earth was 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 the vegetation was all controlled by a mist 
that would come up. And now all of a sudden, this deluge and all these things take place. And it's interesting, too, that if you look at the ages of people, they were talking about 800 years, 700 years, all of this, and all of these ages. And after the flood, there is a steady drop in the ages. There was also a couple of other things that happened. Uh, if you didn't have rain, you didn't have condescension or clouds, you didn't have all of this other happening, there was a different ultraviolet light coming through from the sun. There was a different filtering process. And what you find was that there were issues. Uh, and it's very interesting. People always focus on, I think, the wrong part to focus on. But you know, it says in chapter 9, or in chapter 9, verse 20, it says, Noah, a farmer, was the first to plant a vineyard. First to plant a vineyard. He drank so much of the wine that he got drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And you see the story where Ham comes in, and people have tried to come up with, well, what was it that was so devastating that Ham did? And they come up with all of these crazy ideas. There isn't anything, I believe, more than the fact that he shamed his father, that he saw him, and I believe part of it was that they had made grape products before but with the atmospheric change they probably never saw fermentation before and so all of a sudden his dad is drunk and acting so weird and he probably was mocking him and laughing at it told his brothers they come in and without looking they cover their father they didn't know what to make of it and I believe part of it was that they didn't understand the concept of fermentation at that point because the atmosphere had changed. There was a climate change. And the, you also see in some of these places, when it's going through the list of people, it mentions during Peleg's time that the earth shifted, that there was division of the earth, that it was pulling away and water in between the development of continents and other things like that. There were the, the um, what do they call them? The plates, the seismic plates that were, that were we, we, they say they're still pulling apart slowly, but still doing that. But there was a lot of upheaval that happened at that time and everything changed. All of the ages began to drop in numbers. And it was, I, I believe that it was something of that effect. And, you know, this was, you know, something to consider. He said in chapter 11, verse 4, something similar that we read earlier in another place where it says in verse 4, Come, let's build ourselves a city with a tower that has its top reaching up into heaven so that we can make a name for ourselves and not be scattered all over the earth. It was kind of interesting that if you look in chapter 10, it tells where the different tribes or the different sons had separated and gone there. But chapter 11 goes into the details about what took place because all of them were content. They spoke one language. They, uh, they, they, they were with one accord to get all of this done. It said in verse 5, Hashem came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. Hashem said, look, the people are united. They have a single language and see what they're starting to do. At this rate, nothing they set out to accomplish will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse their language so that they won't understand each other's speech and it's kind of interesting that when you look at it and you look at what unites people today there are groups and bubbles that people are in they keep communicating the same things over and over again with one another and it has a deleterious effect on all of humanity because nobody, it, all they're doing is repeating. When you look at some of these things that have happened, they take something. We, we looked in 
our modern day Hamas. And you look at them saying that Israel bombed a hospital. 500 people were killed. And the news media said it was from the Palestinian Authority or their health people, which is Hamas, which lies anyway. And it turns out that they looked into it. And it turns out that though, both from the IDF and also from U.S. sources, it was clear with video and everything else that Hamas, that not Hamas, but one of the terrorist groups that were in Gaza, fired and it misfired and it apparently went and exploded in the parking lot of the hospital. So, but by the time all of the news organizations got to that point, they already spread that Israel bombed the hospital. And all of a sudden you have people with one voice, with one language, chanting things from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Or, or gas all the Jews. Or all of these statements that were being made without thinking and without words, without anything. The wickedness and the hatred that is there was, was fermented by words, by lies. And people were willing stooges to be able to repeat the lie to where by the time the truth came out, they were already out of control, yelling and screaming about how violent Israel is and that even the death of all of the Israelis was all Israel's fault. All of those lies, speaking one language, one voice, all lies. And by the time it came down to the truth, you know, I did see that show you mentioned uh, the other day where the teacher made a statement trying to make a point that was, con that was against Hitler, but he made a statement in it and said, Heil Hitler. And in the midst of it, students got that one part that they saw, spread it all over, and his life as a teacher was destroyed. And it wasn't what he had done. It was misunderstood, but the words and the language of people propagated all of this kind of stuff. And we see it all the time today with people where they will put a spin on everything. There was a spin of destruction. And God looked at it and said, as much as he wanted to bring relief, he says, their thoughts are wicked all the time. Always violence, always Hamas. And he destroyed them, the whole world, except for those who were in the ark. And it's sad because it also shows that God has a redemptive plan. You know, when you look at some of these other passages, just mention a couple here I want to bring up. In Acts 2, this is interesting. We mention it sometimes at Shavuot. But there is something very interesting when we talk about the outpouring of God's spirit that took place on Shavuot, uh, Acts 2, and all of that that happened. It was during the festival of Shavuot. And they were gathered together in one place with one mind and one accord. And there was a unifying with the believers that were there. But there was a point where God began to take some of the things that were part of the readings that were done for that time and began to make a manifestation of them with the flashes of light and with the, 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 the sound of a rushing wind and all of this going on as from Ezekiel and other places. And they were wondering, what is this that is happening? And interestingly, they said, some said, what is this? And, and it says in verse 14 of chapter 2, Kepha stood up with the 11 and raised his voice to address them. You Judeans and all you staying in here in Jerusalem, let me tell you what this means. Listen carefully to me. These people aren't drunk as you suppose. 
It's only nine in the morning. It was part of their Shachrit service. It was the morning service. No, this is what was spoken about through the prophet Joel. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And he goes on to speak about this. And the response, he says to him in verse 22, men of Israel, listen to this. Yeshua from that Sarah was a man demonstrated to you to have been from God by the powerful works, miracles, and signs that he performed in your presence. You yourselves know this. This man was arrested in accordance with God's predetermined plan and foreknowledge, and through the agency of persons not bound by the Torah, you nailed him up on a stake and killed him. God has raised him up and freed him from the suffering of death, it was impossible that death could keep hold on him. And he gives all of this thing. The response of the people in seeing this manifestation that they also didn't expect. The people at the flood didn't expect the flood, even though he said, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. <laughs> they didn't know what that meant. They couldn't go beyond their own talking points. But here they said, what? must we do what must we do it says on hearing this verse 37 they were stung in their hearts and they and they said to Kepha to Peter and to the other emissaries brothers what should we do and he tells them to receive Messiah for the forgiveness of your sins and thousands of people responded that day it was amazing how then God began to add daily such as should be saved. But it came with an upheaval. It came with a move of violent rushing wind. Not slaughtering people, but slaughtering their concept of what was valid and true. Taking what they just saw and read and having it manifested physically in their midst. It was very powerful. And Peter, who never could have booked a speaking engagement at the temple, stood up in the midst of it while everybody was wondering, what's going on here? Maze, what's going on? And he says, this is that spoken by the prophet Joel. And he began to speak, and he spoke with authority and with power, and God caused thousands to respond. It was a redemptive message. When we look at other places... You know, you look at it and we say, well, are you condoning violent actions that God brings? Well, I'm not condoning violence. But what he says is, it was an interesting statement. He says, your actions in what he said to the people of Israel, Peter, he says, you denied the holy and innocent one and instead asked for the, re the reprieve of a murderer you killed the author of life. You killed the author of life. But God has raised him from the dead. Of this, we are witnesses. And he shared this in such a powerful way that the people couldn't help but respond. And it was very, very powerful. When we talk about the different things that happen uh, in the portion, there was also in Isaiah in Isaiah 54, he says, enlarge the space of your tent. Extend the curtains of your dwelling. Do not hold back. I was angry for a moment, but with loving kindness, I've drawn you to myself. He says in chapter 54, verse 11, he says, storm-ravaged city. Storm-ravaged city. Unconsoled. I will set your stones in the finest way. Lay your foundations with sapphire. Make the windows shine like rubies. All your children will be taught of the Lord. Your children will have great peace. No weapon made will prevail against you. When you see God moving in behalf of his people, when we turn our hearts to him, he provides opportunity to stand there and be the bulwark, to be able to fight on our behalf. And then you look in 2 Corinthians 10. 
He says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What is he saying? They had their talking points. And as such, they were tearing down the credibility of God. And he says, our weapons are not, are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And what were those strongholds? Words, statements, movements, things that were being said. And he said, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In a way, it's almost like people, when they put their own thoughts on a pedestal, it's as if they are building a zagarat for themselves to make themselves renowned and known in the earth. It's a monument to themselves. And they're so caught up with themselves that they didn't see when the language was, they couldn't communicate. Interesting that it was communication. Why did I mention Acts 2? Because there is something in traditional Jewish circles, rabbinic circles, that talk about the fact that the language being displaced causing the people to scatter and to move out. They said, we don't, we've got to be together. We'll build this and we'll build this city and that way we won't be scattered. It was the cause of them being scattered. Their own purpose of trying to build something on their own for their own aggrandizement was something that had to be stopped by God. You know, there was also, I, I mentioned this, that Noah was outside of the narcissistic bandwagon group think box. He was doing what God said to do, but everybody else was in one box and they said, that doesn't make any sense, doesn't make any sense. He's stupid, he's crazy, he's a crazy guy, don't listen to him. And they were unable to break through, break out of that self-imposed narcissistic box because everything was facing the idea of how important they were, and they couldn't see anything bigger than themselves. Whenever we see these things happening, they create movements that cause people to lose their ability to reason. In Isaiah, in the, in the sixth chapter, it, it says, uh, God says, come, let us reason together, or is it chapter one? Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. They'll be red like crimson. They shall be as wool. God wants to reason with us. But when we sear our hearts and get so caught up with what's important to us over what God has laid out for us, we find ourselves drifting, shifting, and finding ourselves taken by surprise. That's why it says in Matthew 24, in Matthew 24, we read this. Matthew 24, let's look at verse 36. But when that day and hour will come, no one knows, not the angels in heaven, not the Son, only the Father. For the Son of Man coming will be just as it was in the days of Noah. Back then, before the flood, people were, went on eating and drinking, taking wives, becoming wives, right up till the day Noah entered the ark. They did not know what was happening until the flood came and swept them all away. It will be just like that when the Son of Man comes. Now, people will look and try to figure out, is that talking about the rapture? Or is that talking about... Hey, this is not the purpose. He's telling people that if you get so caught up with your own systems of how you think things are, and you're unable to reason and hear what God says, they, you, you are taken by surprise. The connection here is not just with lifestyle issues. The only real reference we have for the lifestyle issues during before the flood was violence and wickedness all the time, fighting with one another all the time, devastating everything, falling apart and crumbling. They were destroying themselves, and in essence, that's what happens when we get so caught up in what we think it's got to be that we end up devouring ourselves, devouring one another, and we end up losing 
a hold on something that's so beautiful that God wants to do in our life. And so when he says this, the son of man comes coming will be just as it was in the days of Noah. And we don't have to embellish all of this stuff. He says back then, here's what it was. Before the flood, people went on eating and drinking. It doesn't mean they were getting drunk. I don't think there was fermentation yet. I don't think they were getting drunk because I, I think that was a real surprise to Noah and his family when his dad got drunk. Taking wives, becoming wives, right up till the day Noah entered the ark. And it says they didn't know what was happening until the flood came and took them away. Oftentimes when we get so caught up in words and in positions and in talking points, people are so caught up emotionally that they just chant. You know, when you have supposedly Jewish organizations saying, cease fire, cease fire, when you have them chanting along with Hamas, intifada, intifada. When you have Jewish people, they're being sucked into this mindset. Do you know, during the Holocaust, you know, it was one of the things that was similar to that. They were bringing propaganda to the people, the Aryan race. And you know, what was sad was many Jewish people listened to it and said, we are Aryan, we are, we are Germans. And when they came to them and said, and they were taking them away, they said, where are we going? Where are you taking us? We're Germans. He goes, no, you're Jews. Up until they were taken away, many of them thought, this can't possibly happen. And the sad part I mentioned before about the Holocaust was not that uh, that that uh, that Goebel and uh, and Hitler and all of those other guys were so wicked and so terrifying and so terrible. They were, but the most amazing thing was how normal people, Lutherans, normal Christian people, believed it and were suckered into a mindset that started with something that Luther said that that little German guy in the cell, Hitler, wrote in Mein Kampf, my struggle. It's just like when we talk about intifada, we talk about these other things, their struggle, it's their struggle. And what is their struggle? Their struggle is with somebody else to blame. And what you saw was he took Luther's words when Luther was probably a bit senile. And while he brought the Reformation, he also brought horrible things. When he saw that he couldn't win Jewish people to his faith, he said, we love you. The Catholics don't, but we love you and we're here for you. When he saw that he couldn't convert them to his position, he became virulent in his hatred for Jews. He said, they are not human, they are like dogs, and they need to be eliminated. Hitler quoted Luther, and the people followed th through. And what did they say in the end when all of the horrible atrocities were over and the war had ended? When they came to trial, what did they say? We were just following orders, just following orders. Not thinking, not processing, not looking and wondering why the screams and the anger and the heartache of people being destroyed and slaughtered was so devastating. They didn't hear it because their orders were more important. Following the talking points was more important. There were those who defied that. Corey Ten Boon and her family and other people like that who hid Jews. But sadly, there were a lot less of those people. Others were sucked right into it. When you see on college campuses today, Jewish kids in solidarity with Palestinians, and not just Palestinians, everybody would like everyone to be happy and free 
and even the idea. You know, Israel over the years has done so much to try to help them. They gave back land for peace so that there could be another state, these people. They gave them concrete. They gave them electric. They gave them all of these resources. And what did they do with it? Did they build schools? Did they build hospitals? Did they build homes? No, they built tunnels to be able to get through underground to Israel so they could kill Jews. They took the resources from the people to be able to kill Jews because that was their prime focus. Everything became Hamas. Everything became violence. And there is no reasoning. And yet when you see people constantly, you know, they, now, and now you hear people, <laughs> I, I don't know, you hear people saying these conservatives, they need to go to reprogramming camps. They need to be deprogrammed. In the meantime, they are programming people with violence and with hatred and all of these things, calling evil good and good evil. We see it happening all through history, and we see this thing culminating even today. But it goes back to this very time when we saw with Noah and we saw with the Tower of Babel and we saw with them even there saying, we want to make a name for ourselves and establish ourselves so we won't be scattered. And then they were scattered because what they were doing was out of sync with what God wanted for them. I just want to read a couple other passages, and then we're going to close. In 1 Peter, he says this. In 1 Peter 2, verse 18, the Messiah himself died for sins. Once and for all, a righteous person on behalf of unrighteous people so that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but brought to life by the Spirit. And in this form, he went and made a proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago in the days of Noah, when God waited patiently during the building of the ark, in which a few, to be specific, eight, were delivered by means of water. It is this idea that with all of the deliberation, all of the words, all of the things, they were so caught up in violence and in their mindset that nobody was free from that thinking. And this is why when it came, they were taken by surprise. And yet they built the mindset that allowed this to happen. Another passage in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, and it is where he says um, in verse 8, Moreover, dear friends, do not be ignorant of this. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some people think of slowness. On the contrary, he is patient with you, for it is not his purpose that anyone should be destroyed, but that everyone should turn from his sins. However, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the, heaven will, the heavens will disappear with a roar, with the elements, the elements will melt and disintegrate. The earth and everything in it will be burnt up. It's like, why does he even, why does God even try? Why does he care like he does if every step of the way we get to a point where we abandon what he says and end up reaping the fruit of our own actions and experience all of these destructive things. He says, since everything in verse 11 is going to be destroyed like this, what kind of people should you be? You should lead holy and godly lives as you wait for the day of God and work to hasten his coming. God wants to bring about all these things. And think, he says, verse 15, think of our Lord's patience as deliverance. Just as our dear brother Shaul also wrote you, following the wisdom God gave him. I find this to be interesting. Peter is talking about Shaul, Paul. 
And he says that he says this about the patients bringing deliverance. He says, as Shaul, as Paul has told, has said, following the wisdom God gave him. Indeed, he speaks about things. Now listen to this verse, verse 16. In, in, indeed, he speaks about things in all his letters. They contain some things that are hard to understand, things which the uninstructed and unstable distort to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. It's amazing. He's saying, Paul is saying all the right things, but people are so caught up in themselves and so caught up in these other ways of looking at it with their anger and their hatred that they are unable to hear what he's saying. He's saying the unstable and uninstructed distort what he said. It's amazing. I've seen it on both sides where people will take statements out of context and say, look at what this means. And they tell you what it means. And you say, wow, that's terrible that they said that. But then you look in the context, you find out that it didn't say that at all, that there was a context that you had to look at to really understand what was being said. And it wasn't what they spun it to be. It's just amazing. We are so susceptible to these things as human beings. There won't be a flood, but <laughs> he says there'll be elements will melt with fervent heat. That doesn't sound very exciting and very good. But all of these things, you know, when we talk about building our own towers, building our own place, a monument to ourselves. In all of that building, we are missing the mark and our own actions bring about the results of our choices. In Proverbs 18, he tells us about a strong tower but not one of our own creation. He says, Proverbs 18, 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. God wants us to make the Lord to be our tower, to be our strength, to be our high tower, our place of refuge, and to be able to move away from those things that bring us to a point where we are like storm-ravaged cities, unconsoled. And what does God do? I will set your stones in the finest way. Even in the midst of all of that, he says these are like in that chapter in Isaiah 54. He says, this is like the waters of Noah to me. In the same way that I said I would never bring total destruction in this manner, he says he's talking about his commitment to his people. It's very, very powerful. But again, we want to fight in ways that the world does. And if you take up the armaments in the way the world does and you spew out the same kind of list of words of anger and hatred towards others, you get sucked into the same mindset, even if you're not on the same team. But God wants to set people free. And he wants to do it in a way that will bring change in people's lives. Isn't it amazing? I mean, I don't know what people were thinking, but maybe they, Noah's descendants looked at all that happened. And somehow they, knew, they all knew the story. In every nation, there is the story of the flood. In every nation you go to, they have a story of the flood. But after a while, you lose context. And when you lose context, you end up coming up with things. Well, we don't want a flood to ever happen again. Let's build giant towers. And we'll worship our gods on that tower. Abandoning the creator? Not good. They were united. They were on the same wavelength as one another. And God's tactic there was not to destroy them. God's tactic was to confuse their language. I mentioned before, I don't know if I said it, if I finished it, but there is a description that when Messiah comes and when there is a move of God's spirit, 
He will restore language, communication with people. And so on that day of Shavuot, when they said, we are hearing these Galileans speaking the praises of God in our own language. How is this happening? There was, in a way, a prophetic concept that when Messiah comes, he'll restore the capability of having communication once again, the languages, and hearing the praises of God. And people responded to it. Now, it didn't, wasn't a panacea that stayed that way either. But nothing really does. We need to be steadfast and immovable in our walk with the Lord and see God do all of these different things in our midst. There is so much that God wants to do. There's so many things we could see here, but God is not coming down with judgment to just wipe everybody out. That's not his heart. But when he sees that we are destroying everything, corrupting everything, their hearts were corrupted and they were violence all the time. That meant there was no place for reasoning. It corrupted the animals. It corrupted the livestock. It corrupted everything that they were doing. It was all a part of that same mindset, which would have destroyed the world anyway. And God looked and said, but Noah, one man, you can look at the world around us and wonder, where is this world going to? Maybe God is looking and saying, but Mark, but Jeff, but go down the line of people and say, he sees something. And as we stand for God and stand for the things that he is doing and stay steadfast and immovable in our walk with him, even though we may find times where it seems like shifting sand, God wants to bring stability and strength into our lives to wipe away all of the violence, to wipe away all of those things that easily encumber us. He says to lay aside every sin and the weight that so easily besets us, to run with patience the race set before us, looking to Yeshua, the author and finisher, completer of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the execution stake, endured all those things, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He was looking at the goal, not at the temporary place that he was passing through. And knowing that it would eventually birth new life in humankind and see God bring about things that we can't imagine Avinu Malkain, our Father and our King, we thank you that you are the one who lets your light shine out of darkness, that we can be troubled but not crushed because you are there for us. And Lord, we ask you to bring about these things. As in the days of Noah, we're seeing these things all over again. People are caught up with their selfies. They're caught up with being famous. Lord, clear people's minds, clear people's hearts. Bring revelation and insight. Let your spirit reason with their hearts and give us the ability to set captives free, to see people rescued from all of these detrimental things going on around them, to not be like mind-numbed robots, but to be set free to experience the amazing treasure that we have in the Messiah, the sacrifice that you made for us, the provision you made to set people free. Lord, we want to see with all of the things going on around us that we don't have the capability of handling ourselves, fixing them. There are no fixes that we can come up, human fixes, but there is a transformation by your spirit to bring about change in the hearts of people. And Lord, we pray that you would cause people to wake up from their stupor and to be set free by the power of your love that nothing can separate us from. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in the Messiah Yeshua. 
death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that we have in you. And we ask you to bring opportunity to speak prophetically and powerfully into the hearts of people everywhere, bringing comfort to those who are mourning and setting captives free. In Yeshua's name, amen. As Aaron blessed the people of Israel, so we bless one another with these words. Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'Shem Sar Shalom, the name of our Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And everyone agree by saying amen and amen. Greet one another. Join us for Onik Shabbat and fellowship at the Beth Zion House after service. Invite people out to service. Remember, next week, we're not going to be here. There'll be a wedding here. We will be at the Beth Zion House next week, 206 West Veterans Highway. So make sure you remember that. And if you see people not here, let them know also. We'll see you in shul. Shabbat shalom.